Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. And you'll notice, for the first time in two years, I'm not wearing a mask, a bandana, a bag over my head, anything else I can find, because we're actually turned into a low-risk uh, community. So let's talk about the world in which we live. It's not much different from last week. Um, Russia, Europe, Australia, and actually Chile, interestingly enough, are a little still on the high, high ends of it, the hot spots. The way they calculate this uh, is based on a uh, number of cases per 100,000. And so if you actually look at absolute cases, the United States has had more cases and more deaths than any country. And you can see relative to the other countries, this is our peak. Russia, as you can see, is peaking and now coming down. But Chile and Australia, even though they look hot based on per 100,000, they're actually pretty low. And the good news, though, for the United States, really good news, is that, I mean, it's really dramatic. We are way, way down. The Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation is now projecting an even lower number, probably 30 cases, 20 to 30 cases per 100,000 by the next couple of weeks. So that's, this is all fantastic news. Texas is looking great. You can see that, again, the dramatic difference between just a month and a half to, from there to here. Uh, it is really kind of remarkable. We're down below 10 cases per 100,000, which is fantastic. Our friends in Dimmick County still at 50. Get those javelinas out of there. Get them out. Houston wastewater is also down to 32% of peak level, so we're still coming down, not quite as fast as we'd like, but it's still coming down. Uh, the Texas Medical Center is looking good. We're down to about 500 cases in the region. Uh, in total from you know our, our catchment area of 7 million people. So that's actually quite good. We'd like to get it down to 200 and it's heading that way. And hospitalizations have begun to, still dropping, but begin to slow down a bit. They're down to about 100 cases or 100 admissions per day last week. The problem with admissions is pretty soon, or, you know, as our hospitals begin to ramp up, uh, there are people being admitted who are positive before a procedure, but not necessarily admitted because of COVID. So I think we're going to continue to see uh, baseline numbers of patients being hospitalized with COVID that just because they show up and test positive. If you look at the latest CDC uh, stoplight analysis, I don't know why it's green, yellow, orange instead of green, yellow, red, but you know, their, their stoplight analysis puts us at a low risk and actually we're, you know, we're green all the way. Uh, they, their data follow a little bit behind ours because we in the Texas Medical Center share our data. So they have us at 48 per 100,000, but most recently we're at actually 6 per 100,000. So we're actually in great shape. So just to put it in ways that might be a little bit more easy for people to understand, the rodeo is back on. So we, you know, we closed the rodeo two years ago. We didn't have it last year, and now we're having it. So Energy Stadium, which has been packed, holds 72,000 people. And if we're six cases per 100,000, think about, think about this, is that translates to maybe having four, four people COVID positive in the entire stadium. So that's actually pretty remarkable. Now, just to show, show you what difference uh, we are, where we are now compared to two years ago, you know, the R number, the infection number uh, for Omicron is about 10, which means one person contacts people and infects 10 more. So if a person with Omicron walked in two years ago, into uh, Energy Stadium, and we only had four people who were infected. Well, in five days, 40 would be infected. And in 10 days, 400 would be infected. And in 15 days, 4,000 would be infected. And in 20 days, 40,000. So within a month, we'd have this raging pandemic, which is, a, you know, or epidemic locally, which is what we saw two years ago. Well, now the R number is about the effect of R number, not the R number for the virus, but effectively, it's less than one. It's actually 0.5. So in that case, those four cases that are walking around the Energy Stadium might infect two people. So that's why we're in such a good shape right now and why I'm pretty comfortable with the rodeo going on and, and I think we'll be pretty safe. We might see a bump or two, you know, we'll see some cases come from the rodeo, but that right now the immunity in the community is so good, I think we're, we're in good shape. So Omicron is the dominant variant. I mentioned this the last couple of weeks. The, the uh, second variant or mutation of Omicron, BA.2, is increasing. That's that little pink bar. It's not, there's not enough susceptible people really to sustain, sustain that growth. But there was an interesting paper that came out uh, this, this week that looked at BA.2, this new variant, 
uh, again, a mutation of BA.1, could that actually reinfect somebody who had BA.1? So they reviewed 1.8 million cases between November 22nd and February 11th, so just the last couple of months, and they found 187 examples in that 1.8 million that were reinfection cases. So they looked to see, you know, how many were actually a BA.2 reinfecting somebody who had BA.1, so with the second Omicron variant infecting someone who got the first one. And there were only 47, but there were 47. So it was interesting. You could get reinfected. But amazingly enough, every single one of, the, one of those people were young, unvaccinated individuals that had mild disease. So it sort of suggests that, and it was a very short time period. So you, you could imagine someone getting BA.1, not having a complete immune response, but then getting reinfected with BA.2 shortly within that, that tiny window. And that's what seems to have happened. But once again, it shows you if you're immune or if, you, you know, if, you were, if that person was vaccinated, they almost certainly wouldn't have been reinfected with the second Omicron variant. So it, it, it rarely happens. It's not common. It was 47 cases in 1.8 million. But it shows that it's possible and it gives one more reason why you should get uh, vaccinated. Now, trying to figure out what are we, my sister's asking me always, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So trying to figure out what's going to happen, I do think we can get some insight by looking at what has happened. So this is, before Omicron, this is a study that looked at the five different waves. We had two little ones, the big peak that was alpha, another little one, and then another big peak that was delta. And what I think this really reminds me of the way flu is. You have these, you know, way, these seasonal variations, the slight increases, and then when there's a big change in, the, in flu, you get a giant peak, and that becomes an epidemic flu. Well, this is all like a compressed timeline of that. We have these waves of infection, but when there's a major variant like Alpha or Delta, we have a giant peak again. Uh, so it, assuming that we don't get another huge mutation, which of course that's an assumption, we should have these waves that are seasonal. And so I, I imagine we will begin to see a seasonal wave probably in the fall. The other interesting thing is just look at the difference in the regions of the country during those various waves. And what you can see is the Northeast had this huge peak, and that was because it was introduced into New York, a num number of different cases, and the population was completely susceptible. So you have this giant wave, and what's interestingly enough is you notice they did not have a big wave in the Delta because they also were highly vaccinated, where the South had the big wave uh, with Delta. And the reason for that was we had the lowest vaccination rates. So it, again, it shows you a susceptible population will always have a big surge with a new virus. In the case of new, the Northeast, it was susceptible because there were no vaccines available. In the case of the South, it was because we didn't have really good vaccination rates. So what are we gonna see you know, in the future, is, which is my, my sister's big question. Okay, tell me, is it gonna come back? What's gonna happen? It's hard to really know. But the thing that gives me the pause the most is that only 65% are not vaccinated. Um, and so if you look at the, the world map for vaccination status, you can see most of Africa is still unvaccinated. And that's a real problem because that means there are still places in the world that can have replicating virus. And that whenever there's replicating virus, that's where you can have uh, you know, variants emerge. So just trying to predict what's going to happen in the future is a little bit hard, but you know, we now know that with the mRNA vaccines, immunity wanes. So it, it begins to go down you know, after six, seven months. We also know that you know, people will start going indoors again in the fall when it gets cold and in the winter. If immunity wanes and it's still circulating because the whole world isn't vaccinated, we're likely to have those waves that I mentioned before. The other thing is we always are concerned about the emergence of, an emergence of a new variant, and I think that's a big issue. And so what the world needs to do is really have a strategy for how do we vaccinate everyone. Uh, and that's really, really important. The other thing is we should prepare now because it's going to happen. We're probably going to need boosters in the fall. So rather than declare victory, we, we can be happy we're in a lull. We're happy that things are low right now. Spring's going to be okay. Summer's going to be okay. But we know we're going to have to get boosters out to everybody, so let's just prepare for it now. And then the other thing I'm hoping is we'll see second generation vaccines that are longer lasting, have more durable, as we say, and maybe have more broader protection against all the variants. So, you know, at this point, because things are uh, sort of beginning to settle down, I thought we'd go back, uh, start reviewing some of the complications of COVID. 
that are, you know, once you've had COVID, what do we notice about the lasting imp uh, imp impact on, the, on patients? And one of the really interesting things has been that COVID and the relationship between COVID and diabetes. And for one thing, we know that diabetic patients had a much harder time with COVID, much more severe disease. And there are a couple reasons for that. They, had, uh, they have more ACE2 receptor, the receptor that's required for the virus to get into cells. So it's easier for the virus to get in, into cells of, of diabetics. They also had a, tended to have higher viral loads. In other words, the virus replicated more in them. And there was a study out of Columbia University that showed that there was an increase in diabetic ketoacidosis in adults. And there was also a couple of studies that showed that children particularly had diabetic ketoacidosis complications more often. But mostly that was attributed to the, one of the complications of the lockdown. They got less uh, follow-up. Uh, they had problems that were less likely to be seen by doctors. And so that was another one of the complications of the pandemic, that you know, not necessarily the virus, but because of the lockdowns. But there's also some data that shows that COVID itself might increase the incidence of diabetes, might actually cause diabetes. And there are two very interesting papers, one paper in Nature that took the human cells that actually make uh, insulin. These are um, uh, islets that can be grown in cell culture. And they looked to see, do they express the receptors needed for the virus to enter the cells that make insulin? And they did. They do express ACE2. And another very important protein, it's called transmembrane serine protease 2, which is a very important protein that allows the virus to get into cells. And what they showed was when you culture these cells with virus, the virus actually enters the cells and replicates. And not only does it, does it replicate in these cells, it causes a reduction in insulin secretion, uh, which, is a re which is what, you know, the important part about managing um, the body's glucose. And it also uh, it impairs the ability for the cells to recognize uh, glucose-stimulated secretion. So when glucose concentrations are low, it doesn't, it sort of prevents stimulation of insulin secretion. They looked in people and found that the same thing could be true in, it was true in people, that they could detect those very same receptors in human tissue. And there's a great, the, nice picture they show here. This is the uh, ACE2 receptor in red, and in green is, uh, is C-peptide, which is an indicator of insulin production. And when you merge the two images, green and red, you see yellow. So the same cells that are making uh, the ACE2 receptor uh, are, are the same cells that make the C-peptide, which which shows that they're the insulin secreting cells, and those are the cells that get infected. There was another confirmatory study by Wu et al. in Cell Metabolism that showed basically the same thing, that they proved that in autopsy patients, you could see these uh, receptors on, uh, in insulin secreting cells. So really interesting that SARS might directly cause diabetes by damaging the cells that secrete insulin. So let's turn, because the Olympics are over, let's turn to the world of sports. Uh, in ten for tennis, officials in France announced, of course, that they no longer require visitors to show proof of COVID, <laughs> allowing Djokovic to come defend his title. Anyway, so be it. Uh, the NFL also started now, to, they dropped all their uh, COVID protocols. Of course, it's the off season, so I'm not sure what, <laughs> what the purpose of that is. But, you know, they were pretty good because 95% of the players and almost 100% of the team personnel were vaccinated. So I give them a lot of credit. Uh, the PGA Tour has said that next week they're returning to pre-pandemic uh, access to player facilities. And so far, right now, only the NBA and the NHL are actually, uh, uh, they've relaxed some of their protocols, but they haven't eliminated them altogether. So I want to finish today with a couple of shout outs. Uh, first of all, International Women's Day was this week, which celebrates the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women. We were very excited that Dr. Huda Zagbi is a professor uh, at Baylor College of Medicine and uh, director of the Jan, uh, the Jan and Dan L. Duncan Neurologic Research Institute at Texas Children's, uh, was named as one of the recipients, as was Ann Barnes, the Senior Vice President at Harris Health. So congratulations to the two of you. A giant shout out to Dr. Amy McGuire, who leads our Center for Ethics and the Baylor faculty worked with her to develop a really important policy paper on better understanding mental health needs and try to improve mental health care in our communities. And finally, I was at the rodeo on Monday, and a giant shout out to Audrey Lindsay from Midland, Texas. She won the mutton busting competition by riding that, that mutton all the way to the end of the, the road there. Uh, she wants to be a doctor. She was interviewed. It was a great interview. And I want her to know that we're keeping a place open in a class for her for 2039. So congratulations to you, Audrey. Anyway, have a great weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.
here comes the Baylor College of Medicine chuck wagon, rounding the corner. Here comes Lily in the Baylor College of Medicine chuck wagon. <laughs> Man, something doesn't look right. Uh, I guess it's okay. Welcome to the Houston Rodeo Championships. Lily Klopman from Houston, Texas. The first horse's nose to cross the white line on the west side. What if I sit up? It's right behind the. Look, it's right behind the chair. What if I sit up and I'm all green? Really gonna get that? Uh, good. Keep going. Oh, right there. Why is Commander Lily outside? She thinks objects are larger in space. Got her back feet. Pull the green down. Good. Fantastic. I am talking. <laughs> Are we ready to get by? West side, baby. <laughs> West Platinum, you can walk in and okay. Hey Lily. Where's all where's all the food? What'd you do with the food? Where's the food? What'd you do with the food? Lily, go get your chicken. Run, 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 run. 